since we are in Switzerland, let's begin sharp. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Imre Kocsis. I'm an assistant lecturer at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics in Hungary, Budapest. I'm with the Department of Measurement and Information Systems there, and I will talk about teaching blockchain to university students and professionals, approach experiences and reflections. So, a warm-up question. How many people from academia here? Oh, okay. Yeah, this will be one of my points, trying to <laughs> talking to your audience. Uh, for the other people, I hope it will be still worthwhile to hear this talk. This will be about mostly experiences and how we approach teaching blockchain, so not about the corpus, the subject material per se. I hope that's, that's okay with you. So who we are, in a bit more detail. <clears throat> Inside the department, we are the Fault Tolerance Systems Research Group. That's pretty close to blockchain, blockchains. Uh, founded by Professor Potarica, and uh, the whole research group is 20 people strong, but these are the key people working on blockchain uh, right now. The whole field, the whole direction was bootstrapped by 2016 IBM Faculty Award awarded to Professor Potarica. That was still back in the days of Fabric version 0 0.6, when the Code was the documentation, the documentation was the code, so that was the early time. We did performance modeling and analysis uh, in cooperation with Duke, and uh, based on our efforts uh, in this topic and others, we are very proud to have become an associate academic member of Hyperledger. We did a Hyperledger internship, there was a mentor and mentee at us, uh, one of the key maintainers of Caliper, the performance measurement tool, is that guy there with the beard, Attila. I do work, I hope, rather actively in the performance and skill work group led by Mark there. And, uh, <laughs> and we also participate in the training and education work group, which, as I see, I speak mostly to academic people. I encourage everybody to at least check out. It's worthwhile on the one hand, and on the other hand, we do need the people. I'm also a national delegate to the Blockchain Technical Committee of ISO, and that's that. So, a really short disclaimer, these will be our own experiences. We are an engineering school, mostly computer engineering and electrical engineering faculty with strong computer science people, but that's not the focus of the faculty. We have our own geography, we have our own industrial environment, and uh, also this whole talk will be quite opinionated. I've been working with Hyperledger Fabric for half a year before I began to check out Bitcoin and the Ethereum in earnest, so I skew towards the permission side. So your market may vary, and destination we love puns and wordplays. Uh, generic remarks. <clears throat> so there are a few things that, independently of your audience, you may want to be aware of. First thing, it's 2018, and uh, if we work in blockchain, we still all educate even when we don't want <laughs> to educate. It's the end of 2018, and still, what you want to talk about is interesting things, permission ledgers, pluggable consensus, identity mixer, tokenization, high-performance chain code, zero-knowledge asset transfers coming to Fabric. That's super interesting, and chances are that what your audience knows is still that Bitcoin thing and how that works. And uh, when this mismatch is present, then what comes through is... Well, it's situational what comes through, but my first ever real TV interview didn't really go down that well. Um, the constant seems to be that you have to make sure that this is understood. And by this, I mean the distributed ledger technologies concept. You have a peer-to-peer -peer or quasi-peer-to-peer -peer network that's doing small database or smallish database synchronization. What the network does is some sort of consensus over the transactions, and the blocks only serve a batching mechanism, and there are different honesty incentives across networks. These vary. On the one end, we have Fabric et al. with PBFT and whatnot. No funny money needed. On the other hand, we have Bitcoin and uh, the other altcoins where you need as an economic incentive the presence of a cryptocurrency. And what we try to do is trust disintermediation. When trust disintermediation doesn't make sense, then 
possibly you don't even need blockchains. And Bitcoin, Ethereum, Hyperledger are all just special cases of this core pattern. And if you catch yourself talking about consensus specifics, chances are that you are doing something wrong because understanding, for instance, mining is not necessary to understand the applicability of blockchains for a certain use case. And everybody did struggle with this, but we eventually got there by today. We did this work in our own performance and scale working group too, whole call spent with hashing out uh, the core concepts and defining those. And the same happened in standardization bodies too. But by today, this is more or less covered. See, for instance, the NIST internally report A202, that's very nice. Or check out our performance metrics white paper that's out, really nice, and maybe you should give it a read. So there are three key challenges across the board there seem to be three key challenges across the board when you teach blockchain. One is there's always, there seem to be still always a FUD factor that you have to cope with. Or my take is actually that it's not the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that you have to manage. Rather, you have to disperse confusion and doubt. So you have to drive in that this is a multi-party DB and openness and the funny money may not be required. It may be, but deciding about it should be a conscious, unopinionated, analytic effort. And on the other hand, fear and uncertainty may be justified. Who has seen Hyperledger Tinola? There's a little moth-like creature eating your fabric, and there's where the name comes from. So at DEF CON 26, a really good research group did present ways and ways and ways to break a Hyperledger fabric network. And those are very well funded. It does, it, this doesn't mean that fabric is rubbish. This means that uh, if you don't configure it properly, it will be breakable. And on the other hand, when you intend these networks to be immutable and everlasting, almost everlasting, then these become really serious questions. And you have to pose the question whether you can justify the value and uh, is your incentive adversarial model right? Um, these have to be addressed, uh, but this fear and uncertainty factor is something else than simple doubt and confusion. You have to disperse the confusion and doubt and uh, reason rationally about the actual risks the way that we've always been doing. Second is that, yeah, you have to stay on your toes. So although uh, the speed of evolution in the whole blockchain sphere seems to have uh, slowed down a bit. The domain is still evolving quite fast. So the distributed DB syncing uh, is settling in. What we see now is actual applications, privacy deployment, governance. See yesterday's key keynote from uh, Accenture. It was very good, uh, in my opinion. Still, you have to be really at the bleeding edge still, and that's not always easy. And the key challenge number three is that, uh, in my, my opinion, you should get people back to Earth at the beginning of any engagement. Most of these blockchain stuff can be explained in simple terms, from Bitcoin to Hyperledger, not oversimplifying. What I mean is factually. And when you present the facts, what a network a system can do and what it can do, instead of all the astroturfing about the dreams that what should it do, then people calm down and begin to think rationally. Uh, and yeah, falling BTC price and the end of the ICO craze may have actually helped out. Um, so, speaking in specifics, uh, what should we teach? My first premise is that you can't ditch all this. This is simply impossible, and you shouldn't even do that. Uh, this is a nice infographics from uh, Black Moon Crypto, and what I use it for is to demonstrate that this, uh, the whole blockchain sphere is uh, still a pretty much untractable problem. You certainly can teach the classic academic stuff, consensus mechanisms or what we have been doing for two years, performance measurements and uh, analysis, or the specifics of non-deterministic Byzantine fault replication. This is a really good paper I like from Kashan and uh, Vukalic. Um, but the question is whether you should teach this. 
So one of our own results, if you like, is a first step at a educational design space for blockchain education. It seems to be so that there are sure the core technologies and data models and the algorithmics at uh, the foundation. So this is the computer science stuff. On top of that, there are the platforms and frameworks, say Hyperledger, networks, deployment, operations, integration, overlays, including Lightning Network and the like, so overlays in uh, the broad sense. On top of that, when you have all these, you can speak about transformative applications, patterns of cooperation, say, putting a supply chain on the blockchain, uh, or uh, if we are at that, any workflow, and this is something Laszlo, my colleague, will talk about in this room in the afternoon. Uh, you will want to have solution design methodologies, you will want to have approaches to blockchainify uh, existing solutions and processes, and on top of that, you will want to think about the socio-economic and environmental impacts of the technology. You will have to have regulation, legislation, policy making, there's market engineering, governance, uh, investment, entrepreneurship. Um, there's all sorts of dimensions you can approach the blockchain sphere from. So actually, from an educational point of view, you have an optimization problem where you have to choose from these boxes and somehow come up with a path that makes sense for your audience inside the subset of boxes that you chose. Notice that most of these topics can be mapped to types of people that will apply that body of knowledge. So this is mostly core computer science, computer engineering, computer engineering and system engineering, analysts, domain experts, and at the top we have decision makers and public servants. Now the problem with blockchain is twofold. Most of these boxes are still evolving, emerging. What we have at the bottom, that seems to settle, or at least the evolution it seems to slow down. And exactly as we heard from Accenture, now the focus is shifting upward and upward and upward. Because when you have a fabric, that's nice, but you have to have operations. What do we do when we have to upgrade the software? Still not that well answered. And when you have answered those questions, you will have governance questions like, what do we do when the whole database is borked? And we all, as a consortium, have to roll the thing back. So this is where you have to pick and choose from. And there are further dim dimensions. Uh, this can be further divided by technology and apl application domains, making a full pyramid of the thing, but then we would come seriously close to uh, business science, and that's, that's not us. So, what I can speak about as specific experience is these audiences. We did have a large elective course in the spring uh, that was approximately 200 students. Uh, we have focused education. This is, there's a whole series of courses, uh, beginning from an introductory topic lab with the focus, uh, then independent student projects, and those lead up to BSc uh, and MSc theses. And we, yeah, we have a few people who do blockchain stuff in their PhD, but that's, that's really a whole uh, different world. We conduct industrial courses, and we have an EIT digital uh, course in planning um, that will be a mixed blended modes and face-to-face -face model. That's next year's story. So what are these audiences? They're <clears throat> well, all sorts of people, actually. So it still seems to be high driven. I did say upfront in the description of the course that this will not be about cryptocurrencies. But as you know, people don't read the EULA, so many people, many students came there asking about cryptocurrencies. We did speak a bit about them, but that wasn't the focus. And as a surprise, many alumni popped up in the room. It's free any Hungarian citizen can come. 
as long as there are seats in the room, but that was a really pleasant surprise for me and a real novelty personally. In blockchain focus, we have students actually wanting to work with Hyperledger, and yeah, there we try to provide courses at the decision maker and architect level, and also customized ones. What we really didn't want to do and lose quite a bit of money with, I think, uh, but it was money well not earned, is cryptocurrency courses, because there's a whole market for that. At the end, we ended up certainly explaining uh, the difference between the two worlds and what the basics of cryptocurrencies are, but that seems to be par for the course still. So, the course, 200 students, that was for an elective course, that's a hefty number. Those tend to max out the 20 at our university. 14 lectures, midterm exam, homework, the basics. So what may be interesting to you is the educational goals and non-goals for an elective at an engineering school. So the main goal was to give a uh, informed technically informed bird's eye view. So basically the theoretical and technical basis for independent study without all the marketing and hype craft that you would, uh, you would encounter in a truly independent uh, study without a proper basis. Key concepts, application types, rationale, and just the basics of crypto financial mechanics, uh, and certainly some hands-on at the application level, but this is a university course. So what even I was taught in the way, maybe not, this is not the good approach, but even I was taught in the way that these are the basics. There's the documentation, there's your assignment. Go and do that. Um, explicit non-goals were crypto and token economics, uh, Theoretically and technically challenging topics, yeah, well, at the end I did delve into a few of those, uh, maybe shouldn't have, and uh, what we did keep ourselves to is no cryptography. So cryptographic primitives should remain cryptographic, cryptographic primitives in such a course, uh, treated as black boxes. Uh, key topics, uh, this is basically the structure of the course. First and foremost, the DLT concept, a whole lecture, 90 minutes, just about distributed ledger technology concept and its potential applications and its properties. How does it differ from a centralized trusted third party um, sphere? Then we had three lectures on public networks. You have to talk about Bitcoin, you have to talk about Ethereum, and you have to have a Solidity hands-on lecture because Solidity is slowly creeping in even into Hyperledger. I may not be overjoyed by that because I have my own strong opinion about the language, but this is how the field works. Second block, permission consortial networks, a full lecture on the architecture and conceptual elements of Hyperledger Fabric, another one on Composer, where concepts as oracles and such are also uh, pushed into the material, and the full hands-on uh, lecture on Composer, because, well, that's the tool still, although there are plans about redoing it. Uh, that you can use to put together an actual business application at a high level that will work on a blockchain. Conceptually, it's super. I understand why they want to rework it. I just hope that uh, the good properties will be kept. <clears throat> Third block is uh, a uh, overview of potential and existing applications in a specific domain. Now, uh, we are a department that has uh, strong background, strong and long-running background in embedded systems and safety-critical systems and automotive systems and as such. So IoT and cyber-physical systems were a rather natural choice. Uh, we did look at all the meaningful use cases and the rationale for those there. 
you may have heard about IBM and the containers and the sensors in the containers and all the temperature readings from the containers coming into a fabric. So basically, if you're not familiar with IoT and cyber physical systems, that sort of stuff, when you have sensors in the field and you have to do something with that data. And this was the point where I sneaked in my model of uh, layered model of tokenization and uh, permission use cases that I will uh, show briefly. Uh, fifth block is system engineering. We had a serious look about uh, writing, architecting actually high performance chain codes, smart contracts in Fabric, because many application domains require that period. Uh, we did have a look at the evolving interledger protocol that has an implementation in uh, Hyperledger 2. And uh, as an outlook towards the more theoretical topics, I did present a simplified error propagation model for Fabric, and we had two really nice, good guests. So why this is important? I think I will skip that. Uh, anybody who knows what fault trees are and begins to think about fault trees in the context of uh, fabric uh, endorsement policies will know what I talk about. Yeah, and local industry, oh, yeah, actually it's a little, not secret, not even a secret, it's a fact of life that the local industry is mostly uh, tied to public networks, so Bitcoin, Ethereum and the like. So those guys spoke about such topics, and they are really good, so uh, I'm happy that we had them. We will see whether we can get, for next year's lecture series, uh, a guest who's uh, coming from the permissioned uh, side of the world. Homework, smart contract development in pairs, basically. Um, I'm still not sure whether this should be extended to full solution development, because, you know, it seems to apply that smart contract development is 10% of the effort, say, and all the other stuff, front-end and uh, web server and whatnot, and back-end integration take up the uh, remaining 90%. So we chose to use Composer instead of Fabric. Things changed in the last one year. If you think about assigning Fabric homeworks, then this may not be such a risky proposition as it was one year ago. At that time, I didn't want to go there. There were half of the uh, assignments and uh, were Solidity, half of the assignments were Composer, and people could apply for the specific homework assignments. Can you guess what was the ratio of the applications between Solidity and Composer? Anybody? Composer. Hmm? Composer. Uh, not really. <laughs> Even worse, it was about 70% uh, solidity and uh, s approximately 30% for Composer. So the thing is, students, these are mostly BSc students. What do they he hear about? Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the like. This is the super hip stuff. There is this slight 10% of students that, uh, that would have gone to the enterprise software direction 10 years ago, too, that uh, have uh, a bright spark in their eye, eye from Hyperledger Fabric, but this is a minority. The majority came for the crypto finances. I hope that, at least for some of those, we could show that the engineering-wise serious stuff is on the other side and also cookies. Um, what we seem to have done right, as measured by the midterm, the blockchain-based DLT concept, definitely. Uh, basics of Bitcoin and Ethereum, including the conceptual uh, basics of mining. Much of the possible use cases. So most of our students in the midterm could formulate uh, a solution for a blockchain use case. Um, better put, presented with an industrial or business use case, could argue about putting that use case on a blockchain. And overall, there was a good reception. What we could have done better is teaching what the meaningful use cases are. So, you know, meaning that something can go on the blockchain doesn't mean that it should go on the blockchain. But even industry is still a bit uh, spotty with this. Fabric architecture and consensus, there was a 
bit of an uneven take up. Uh, I do love the architectural paper, but that was written for a different audience. And this has changed, uh, so there's a huge shout out to, I think he's not here, to Shirnish and, uh, and the documentation working group. Uh, this has changed. You can give out the fabric docs now for students. Um, but I suspect we are not the only reasons of this. So the interests of students do come in here too. What we will change for the course starting, I hope, in uh, the beginning of February, is that one year has passed and now we have very solid use cases and we won't be able to avoid presenting financial ones, but we will try to do it in a measured manner, and to the extent an engineering school can do that. We will have to bring in clouds. What we see in the industry, speaking to industrial people, most of them don't really want to, at least in our industrial catchment area, to do fabric directly on their own, uh, data in their own data centers. There's all sorts of clouds where they even have uh, DevOps capabilities out of the box. So this we will have to bring in at least in a uh, demonstrational manner. And there's the next frontier, development processes. How do you come from a problem to a solution? But again, this is still evolving right now, so I still don't know what I will present about that. What is an interesting proposition is that standards become now uh, mature enough to serve as scaffoldings for such a course, at least for the basic concepts. And yeah, most probably all the zero-knowledge stuff must come in. That will be a challenge. And smart contract verification, on the, end, uh, on the other hand, can come in. A few people are doing that in our research group with very good results. Um, period. So Hyperledger, specifically, used by now existing docs. Uh, consider, we consider adding SOTUS and maybe, maybe URSA when it will become ready for that. Uh, and uh, with the hands-on, we will go down to fabric definitely now. And there's the skeleton in the closet for all you academic people. There's an edX course on Hyperledger. So thinking about integrating it into your course, or even thinking about what's the value proposition of your course in contrast to the edX courses, this, this has to be done. If not next semester, in the midterm, definitely. And we do have a cunning plan. We will offer community work as homework. In the performance and scale working group, there are some outstanding things that should be done by somebody so that we can measure stuff and compare stuff, uh, hopefully in a, uh, in a uh, enterprise independent way. So we are talking with Mark and uh, Dan and the other Mark uh, uh, who has a nice benchmark on Corda called Emerald, that's a financial systems benchmark, to simply offering uh, these necessary, truly necessary uh, community works as homework options. This could be a really nice synergy and I encourage all of you to think about that to do that with your students. Students seem to really take to the idea, actually, to work under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation. So open source, at least at us, has a really serious traction. Um, much more serious traction than certain big name companies. Not all of them, but certain. So on the side of industrial courses, if you do such things, let me present to you a few not so secret elements of the secret toolbox. What seems to be really important, one, is that dichotomy between public unpermissioned blockchains and consortial private permissioned blockchains. What is a dichotomy up to the level where you begin to apply the stuff actually using smart contracts? So what is important is using smart contracts, you can write middlewares if you want you can use a blockchain to use it as a quasi-notarized messaging system, because you put in the message, you get out the message, just like MQ. Only thing is that there's an audit trail there. Uh, you can use it as storage, sure. 
You can use it, even use it for multi secure multi-party computation, although that's still really tricky on the mathematical side. So you can remain there. Using blockchain is not about tokens, tokenization. There are levels of ab abstraction. This functionality in itself, for instance, if you want to do some flight recorder-like functionality or continuous auditing or what like, can be very worthwhile on its own without all the token stuff and, uh, and public chains. You can do cooperation patterns, supply chains. There are many cooperation patterns there. Uh, yeah, actually, on the general level, that's workflow automation. But that's not the only thing that we know in computer science. There are state machines, too. And you can put state machines into the ledger, too, because why not? So there's this level. Sure, above that, there's all the tokenization and assetization work that you can do. But even that has to be detached from all the interesting and sometimes shady market mechanisms and market economies that you can put above a tokenized or assetized ledger. And when you came up there, this is the point where you may want to begin to think about crypto economics and crypto finance, but you don't have to do that on the one hand. On the other hand, you can do this whole stuff gradually, building up from the simple middleware, for instance, notarized messaging, layer up to providing uh, reverse securitization on a blockchain. There's a whole book now about that. Okay, and this seems to be important too. What makes, seem to make business people um, less agitated about the whole blockchain stuff is that they do have options. You can go the private way, all in an insurance context, and this is woefully outdated, and sorry, but intentionally. Uh, you can do from claim settlement to ins insurance consortia, those exist, to multi-party insurance, all sorts of nice things on permission blockchains. If you want to the public route, you can do that, up to and including community insurance. There are a few Russian companies doing that, I think, on Ethereum. And you can even build chains, not chains, sorry, connections between the two words. The main thing is, that you have to apply rational thinking and ha you have to think about your requirements and choose between the solutions based on your requirements. So, um, this was the education stuff, basically what I have gathered as experience. I hope this was worthwhile. At the end, as a closing uh, block, I would like to show you the fun stuff. So. Uh, the education, the courses, 200 people, and topic lab with tens of people and such, those, those are fields where you have to apply didactics. When you have MSc students, even PhD students, then you can begin to work on the fun stuff. And there's really an enormous amount of uh, nice possibilities and open questions in this sphere. One thing that we are doing in the topic lab still is that we try to put a fabric composer overlay on, uh, over smart intersections. There's a really good quasi-standard from the US Department of Transportation about smart intersections. The whole thing is basically about vehicles communicating using radio and vehicles communicating with the infrastructure, the, in, uh, the intersection using radio. Now, we do have a safety culture and background in safety, so uh, premise one is that you don't put blockchain inside the system, because once it has been done and certified, you don't touch it. That being said, you can do an overlay. Overlay option one is there are so-called red light running events when the car goes into the intersection when the light is red, and the intersection can record it, can put it on a blockchain, the insurance company can see it, the police can see it, and through the insurance company, the insured driver can contest that red light running event by pictures or by the radio signals that the intersection sent his car. Think of unmanned self-driving vehicles. The other one is preemption tokens, uh, where basically you can buy or get tokens for requesting the intersection to basically give you green light. 
Uh, we know that in the emergency services context, possibly may have even some sense for citizens too. And I don't know whether this will come to fruition, but uh, I still hope that we can submit this to the MOBI grant challenge. And we are doing caliper-based stress testing that's led by my colleague Attila Klenik. So we not just put this together uh, in a simulated way, but we've also stress tested it, see what's the performance that we can get out from that. Uh, interesting project. Two is BSC thesis finished of a student of mine. So basically what we do is that fabric is complex. I don't know how many of you have experience in enterprise software, Tivoli, WebSphere, and the like. Those are complex beasts. M plus one types of nodes and configurations and whatnot. The same seems to happen for Fabric, and I'm not that happy about that because I had some previous exposure to IBM Tivoli, but, well, it's, again, par for the course. But this also means that configuring, putting together a Fabric network is not simply about firing up Ethereum nodes and leaving them to that, leaving them to talk to each other, but configuring together the whole network, and when it works, you are happy, although you may have spent two weeks on that. Uh, one of the ways to solve this conundrum is to simply model your network, what you want to have as a network in a visual way, uh, reflect that in a model, and uh, automatedly deploy that model. So you may not want to configure or your CAs and peers and channels manually. What you want to do is draw this little, nice little network diagram and do an automated deployment. We do this with Composer, and it works for a given definition of working, but it works. Yeah, on-chain configuration management and configuration analysis will come. Another thing that we do is uh, taking uh, state charts in Yakindu state chart and generating automatically the composer behavior model for that, or directly Java chain code, and we even had some initial results in the formal analysis of such Java behaviors. Why is this important? Again, our cyber physical context. There are locks that you can drive from the Ethereum network right now. So you can buy a lock from a nice German company that you can make to open and close through Ethereum calls. This is the same. This is actually a security door. But as soon as you get requirements, as two people from the security team have to say, OK, for a request to access a secure room, things get complicated. You have to draw state charts, and you have to analyze them. This is just this. Model. And we are also trying to map out how you can systematically argue about the blockchain applicability of, a, of an existing context. I'm doing this with a uh, pharmacist uh, student of mine in our healthcare engineering uh, program. So that's it. And my colleague, Laszlo Gönci, will speak about BPM process execution on Ledger this afternoon. We have a few minutes for questions, if you have them. And I was told that there are microphones. Yes? Uh, Shoot. Do you have any place uh, on the internet where you have taken this course and like, uh, modeled it out? Where... Sorry, let me give you a microphone. supposed to work yeah okay so do you uh, have you do you have a place on the internet where you have taken your course uh, and uh, so generally a course has a course program yeah so is that program where you have published it and where we can access it is there a uh, yeah uh, the course uh, the course outline is accessible I think even in English uh, the material is not Yet. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, so I, I, I organize a conference in Singapore, and I'm curating a lot of this, uh, whether it's from the public side or the permission side. 
And so I'd like to maybe just hear from you why you lean towards the permission side. Because given that public has, in some ways, more of a movement going on, there's more youth, there is more, um, in some ways, it's more open source, uh, there are more tools out there. Uh, at least this is from my impression. I'd love to hear from your point of view. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Uh, first, some clarifications. One, you can, I don't think that you can more open than the Hyperledger projects are right now. So this, this is the definition of open source, at least in my interpretation. Uh, second, youth, I may give that to you. I'm not that, not, not that young anymore either. The reason we um, lean towards uh, the permission networks is that uh, we are an engineering school. There's a plethora of uh, meaningful use cases for permissioned ledgers in classic engineering and business contexts. And there's no risk because we know that this will and does work and there's software architected specifically for such use cases. Fabric, so tooth, mainly in my interpretation. On the other hand, the public networks, despite all the media, media hype and all the enthusiasm of the younger people, uh, the jury is still out what their future will be. You can gild this thing the way you want, but this is the case. Ethereum specifically, if it sticks around, would be a huge boon to society in general. Because having an immutable, democratic, in the way that anybody can access that, uh, ledger in a quasi-public-like utility, that, that would have huge implications. But most of the crypto stuff is not about this. So when 70% of your students selected Solidity over uh, Composer. What yeah. did you attribute that to? Is that just Look, availability of information that's out there? I when, mean, that, uh, that's my impression. No, I, uh, I think it's the following. When I began to dig deep into the public stuff, then I was amazed by it, and for a bit I was carried about by the novelty and the by the radical novelty of this stuff. That phase, I think, passes for most people. Spring 2018, it was still the back end of the hype curve, if you like. I attribute it to that, this. I don't want to push anybody into any direction. If a student of mine wants to go to the uh, public uh, blockchain direction and do hopefully meaningful stuff there, more power to them. But this is not my world. Thank you. And I do say this up front. So if there are no more questions, then thank you for your patience. I hope uh, it was worthwhile. And if you want to talk to us, then we are here available for further questions.